My guest today is Justine Kochi. Justine, how are you? I'm good, David. How's it going with you? Uh, it's going really well. It was good to see you last month in Chicago, and it reminded me of the good times we had when we worked together years ago. I know. Yeah, those were the good days, giving presentations all the time. So it felt a little bit like back to the old days. <laughs> that was my dream job, being a technical yeah. evangelist. Uh, but um, and so we've both gone on to other things. What are you doing now? Yeah, so I'm a PM on the Azure Cosmos DB team, and I focus on developer experience and developer productivity. I work with some of our SDKs, like the .NET SDK and Go SDK, primarily focusing on the NoSQL API um, and some of our experiences around that. Ah, well, let's start with just defining Cosmos DB for those that are listening that aren't familiar with it. Yeah, so Cosmos DB is a distributed database. Um, we have multiple different data models. So for a long time, we were a distributed NoSQL database. We recently added a Postgres API, which of course is relational. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different APIs that all fit into the Cosmos DB family. But what they really have in common is that they're distributed, um, they're highly performant, and um, really some of the core principles around security and all of those core foundations, um, you know, across all of our APIs are remain consistent. So I think today we can focus on um, the NoSQL API, which is the API that I work with. And um, yeah, yeah really an, talk about some of the benefits. Yeah, that, that's an interesting concept is that Cosmos introduced this idea that you don't, you could, in, you could interact it with with it using different APIs. You could pretend that it's a relational database. You could pretend it's a NoSQL database. You could pretend it's Mongo. And, uh, and it made it easier to migrate code from other databases. Yeah, exactly. So if you're already using MongoDB and you're familiar with the Mongo APIs, you know, our Mongo API is a great choice. Um, and then we also have the NoSQL API, which is really um, like the core, used to be called the core API. Um, and it's the foundation API for Cosmos DB. So it's like our proprietary API. And they're both NoSQL. So if you're working with document or, you know, JSON data types, then both um, of those APIs are a good fit. And with that comes a lot of different data modeling considerations compared to something like a relational database um, where you always want to denormalize everything. For a document API, you really want to build your data model based on how you're going to query your data and how you're going to interact with your data. Mm -hmm. So if you have one data type, say you have like a person and a person has a bunch of addresses, you know, instead of breaking those addresses out into a separate table, you can just embed them directly in the document, um, right. especially if that's how you're going to query. So. Right. Uh, and then before we start to talk about building applications, could you talk a little bit about the scalability? How, how I know Cosmos is known for its scalability. How is that implemented? Yeah, definitely. So as a distributed database, Cosmos DB scales horizontally. So when you add, um, you know, more data, we'll provision, you know, a new physical machine to actually store that. So it's not a scale up model. You're not buying a bigger machine. You're just buying a bunch of little ones. Right. Um, and the way that we distribute your data is with partitioning. So it's really important. One of the first things that you'll need to decide when you create a new container in Cosmos DB is what is the partition key? What value am I going to actually partition all of this data on? Um, and there's sort of two terms that you might hear when you think of partitioning. There's a physical partition and a logical partition. And I really want to explain the difference between those because it can be really easy to get them confused. So a physical partition is the physical machine under the hood um, that's actually storing the data. And a logical partition is the property that distributes the data. So say I'm storing um, a bunch of people and uh, they all live in a city. So I want to partition on city. That mm -hmm. city would be my logical key. The value could be, you know, Los Angeles or Chicago. Um, and then depending on those values, it'll get hashed and it'll get sorted to its different physical partition. So that's sort of the relationship between the physical and logical partition that really ha handle that distribution. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's talk about application development. I want to build an application. I want Cosmos DB to be the database backend for this. Uh, what are the what are the things that I need to know and do to make that happen? 
Yeah. So when you want to build an application, um, one thing that you'll have to think about is, of course, how are you, how much throughput do you need? How many requests are you going to have? What is your container layout? So we talked a little bit about partitioning. When you create a partition, uh, when you create a container, you need to pick a partition key. One more thing you really need to think about um, once you have, you know, your idea in mind, you know what app you want to build. How much throughput are you going to need? How do you decide with Cosmos DB, like, what to provision, you know, we already mentioned you don't buy like a bigger machine. So what if I need more requests? How do I do that? Um, and Cosmos DB uses an abstraction called RUs or request units. It's really um, an abstraction over the amount of work that it takes to do a certain request. So if you think of getting a single item by its ID and partition key, we refer to this as a point read in Cosmos DB, um, you know, single item lookup that costs about one RU for a one kilobyte document. So when you're developing an application, um, you really want to think about, you know, how many point reads are you going to have? How many queries are you going to have? How many items are you going to write? Um, and we have a couple of tools to make deciding how many RUs you need a little bit easier. We have a capacity calculator, um, and it will help you if you say, you know, what size are your documents? How many requests per second are you going to have? It'll tell you how many RUs you'll probably need to serve your workload. Uh, but it is really important to get this right and to think about the right number before you start developing. Otherwise, you might see some 429 errors. This is our throttling code. So I'm sending more requests than the database has you know, resources to serve those requests. So thinking about throughput um, is definitely important for getting your uh, performance that you want. Yeah. OK. And what about the code? What, what do I need to do in my code? Yeah, so we have many different SDKs to develop against Cosmos DB um, with various languages. So I'm going to talk specifically for the NoSQL API. Of course, if you're using Mongo or Cassandra, um, you can use the client drivers that are native to those APIs. But for the NoSQL API, we have .NET SDK, Java, we have Go, um, JavaScript, and Python. So a bunch of SDKs to choose from. I'll focus today on .NET, although actually .NET and Java have a lot of the core concepts in common. Um, and the main concept that those two have in common that some of our other SDKs don't is the connectivity mode. So there's two connectivity modes to choose from. There's direct mode and gateway mode. In direct mode, your application is actually talking directly to the backend node. So we talked about all those physical partitions, right? Those are machines behind the hood. Um, the SDK in direct, direct mode knows exactly where that machine is, and it will make a connection directly to the machine. So hmm. if I do a point read, you know, the SDK knows exactly where to route that request for the lowest latency. Um, there's no like middle hop or anything like that. But um, there are some trade-offs with this mode and the oh. other mode that I mentioned, which is gateway, gateway mode. mode. Yeah. What is, it, what is the gateway mode? So for gateway mode, there's the Cosmos DB gateway, which sits in the middle between your client and the actual backend nodes. And the gateway does all the routing for you, um, which does have an extra latency hop. But that way, your SDK doesn't have all the logic of determining the routing. So we talked about a physical partition, but really it's not just one machine. There's replicas. Cosmos DB provisions four replicas for you. So in direct mode, your SDK is opening four connections for every physical partition. Some applications, some containers, you know, maybe they're large. Maybe you have 10 physical partitions, hundreds of physical partitions. We have some customers with thousands of physical partitions. So once you multiply that number by four replicas for each of those, that's a lot of connections for your yeah. application. Um, so gateway mode can be a good trade-off and can reduce the number of outgoing open connections that you have open. Okay. So I guess if I'm hearing you correctly, the reason why you might choose gateway over direct is if you ha find yourself querying different partitions, switching between partitions many times. Is that the idea? Or is it keep yeah. the same partition over and over again? Maybe the direct would be uh, more efficient. Yeah, especially if you have a lot of physical partitions in your container. So you can't always um, you can't always avoid cross partition querying. Sure. Uh, most applications will have some cross partition queries. Of course, with Cosmos DB, you do want to reduce the number of cross partition queries. Um, but if you think of a point read, right, that's always going to have 
one physical partition because by definition, a point read includes the partition key. So if you're just looking up one item by its ID and partition key value. Um, if you have a query, you could of course include the partition key. So we talked about, you know, partitioning by city earlier. Say I want to get, you know, all of the people that live in Seattle, that's mm -hmm. a key um, in my query. But I don't always want to query that way. What if I want to query, you know, everyone on a different attribute? Say I wanted to query, you know, everyone under 45 or something like that. That would be cross partition. So it is difficult to completely avoid cross partition queries. But um, if you pick a good key, you can reduce them sometimes. Oh, yeah. And then what's, um, you mentioned that it would, there are four replicas created by default in Cosmos DB. Uh, but, and you're connecting to all four of those. Um, what's, what's the reason behind that? If there are replicas, wouldn't just connecting to one be sufficient? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are a couple of different scenarios that you'd want to connect to multiple replicas. And that actually has to do with the consistency mode that you choose. So Cosmos DB offers five consistency modes. We have strong consistency. This you may have heard if you're familiar with other databases. It offers a linearizability guarantee. You'll always see the most recent version of your items. And the way that we do that is because all of your writes are actually committed to every replica before we return an OK response. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't do that way, you know, we just wrote to one, maybe that replica goes down and that write can never be um, you know, committed to the rest of the replicas. So depending on the consistency mode, it determines how many replicas we're actually reaching out to to ensure that we can commit your write. Um, after strong, there's bounded staleness. This basically means that your reads can lag behind either K versions or T time. Um, so say you don't want, you know, more than five writes to happen before all of your writes are um, replicated or T time, you know, 30 seconds or whatever you can pick for your application. And writes may actually be throttled if the replication lag exceeds the th these thresholds. So mm. it is important to pick numbers that make sense in your application. You have enough RUs to serve it. You know, you're able to actually get that replication um, before you're throttling yourself with, you know, overwriting if your staleness uh, bounds are too tight. Got it. So I'm, I'm not guaranteeing that this 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 data is in real time. It's close to, but I am guaranteeing that it's no more than say 30 seconds old. And yeah, so uh, yeah. And and just to clarify that all of the reads are still um we have SLAs for our reads. So yeah. your read SLA for a point read would be less than 10 milliseconds. So I'm not saying your reads are gonna take, you know, 30 seconds or anything like that. This is um how old yeah, basically how stale your data could be. The, so this is on the consistency itself. on the right path. Yeah. Yeah I've, yeah, I've just written a row to the database and I, if I immediately query it, I may or may not get that row back because there may be this uh, T second delay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, 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 the guarantee. And there are other um, consistency modes. So like session consistency, for instance, you read your own rights with sessions. So hmm. say we have an application with a bunch of different users. Um, you know, I'm making updates to my profile, you're making updates to your profile. I'll be able to read my own rights with my session, but you may not see my right. And that's probably okay, right? So it depends on the needs of your application. Do you actually need total strong consistency for every user and every region? So we didn't talk about global scale yet, but with Cosmos DB, you can actually add multiple regions. And this is recommended for any production application to have at least two regions. This is for high availability. So say there's a region outage or some disaster, you know, we still want your data to be available. Um, and if you have multiple regions, then that will be the case. But that creates trade-offs for consistency, right? So for strong consistency, it's not only those four replicas, it's those four replicas in every region that your account is present in. Right. So it starts to get really slow, right? Um, there are actually bounds on strong consistency if you have multiple right regions configured. I think um, it's like 5,000 miles or something uh, yeah. because there's physics involved, right? And it starts yeah. to become an issue if you have the strong consistency guarantees across, you know, an ocean. Um, okay, yeah, so so good stuff. You're, um, uh, tell me a little about um, 
maintaining the application, uh, something uh, writing to a database, writing to any external source or reading from something can go wrong. How, how do we troubleshoot that? Yeah, there's a lot of different tools for monitoring. Um, a couple that I'll point out in our SDK, we have diagnostics. So with every request that you make to the SDK, you'll get a diagnostic string back. And that has a lot of information in it. It includes if there was any retries. So we talked about, you know, having multiple regions. One of the reasons that you'd want multiple regions is if one is temporarily unavailable, um, we can actually retry that request on a separate region. So you'll get a, a list of all the regions that we actually contacted in that specific request. You'll get a full pipeline of, you know, all of the um, handlers and everything that happened in your request. We typically don't recommend, you know, customers don't need to fully understand how to dig through the diagnostics. Um, but if you did have something going on, you had a lot of requests, not just one slow request, but if your P99 was affected. So, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, your what? Uh, your P99. So if if 99% uh, of your requests are within that 10 millisecond latency, mm -hmm. then your application is probably performing roughly how it should. But if your P99, your 99th percentile is affected and is, you know, slower than 10 milliseconds or you're getting a lot of timeout errors or mm. service unavailable or something like that to the point where it is actually affecting that P99, um, then you can start to think about, you know, what's going wrong in my application. Maybe right. I need to open a support request or do some deeper triaging. Um, and we will definitely ask for those diagnostics. So those are really important for troubleshooting, you know, what's going on under the hood. Um, but if you want to do some monitoring yourself and say, you don't know if your P99 is affected, you know, sometimes you need to be able to actually measure this. So we added open telemetry integration and open telemetry is an open source monitoring um, set of libraries and SDKs. And it is really helpful for debugging applications. So we added um, attributes and traces in .NET and Java. You can configure open telemetry. You can set up thresholds. So if you have requests that go over a certain um, millisecond for your point reads or for your non-point reads, so that would be a query, change feed, anything that's like, you know, across multiple um, documents, you can configure those thresholds so that it will capture the diagnostics automatically for you. You no longer need to go into your application and specifically say, you know, if status code equals whatever, log this. If latency is over something, log this. And you don't need to worry about it. Um, open telemetry, all the configuration, it will automatically land in your APM tool, whatever tool you've picked, whether it's, you know, application insights or um, some other tool that you might like. Um. Is there anything we haven't covered that's critical to this uh, idea of building applications with Cosmos DB? Yeah, I think those are a lot of the core concepts. Um, you know, there's tons of great information in our docs and best practices, some things that we, we didn't cover. We talked about the client, you know, opening all those connections in direct mode. Um, so it is important when you're using direct mode to actually create your client as a singleton so that you only have one client for the lifetime of your application. Um, we talked about those connections, but there's also caches, there's metadata, you know, there's the client is pretty heavy for Cosmos DB. Um, it's not like a light rest wrapper, some SDKs. We actually have service logic, we have routing, we have all of that built into the SDK. So oh. if you want performance um, for your application and want to make sure that you're not hitting, you know, high CPU on your machine or resource um, starvation on your actual client machine, make sure that you're creating your client as a singleton. And um, that means one client per account. So if you have a multi-tenant environment, um, tenancy can be set up in Cosmos DB in multiple different ways. You can have tenancy per partition, you can have tenancy per container, um, or you can have tenancy per account. And of course, if you have multiple Cosmos accounts that you're talking to in one in one application, you will need to have multiple Cosmos clients. Uh, but it is important that each one of those is a singleton. So you're kind of reducing the number of resources that you're, um, or instances that you're creating your application. And I think I hear you saying that some of the things like routing and 
retry logic, that that's automatically built into the SDK that I as a developer do not need to code that. Is that a true statement? Oh, yeah, that's a great call out. So we do have retry logic in the SDK, but there are still some retries that you'll want to handle in your application. So some things that are built into the SDK, 429, we talked about our use, making sure that you have enough resources to actually handle your application. And if you don't, you'll get a 429, which means you know, you're being throttled. You're, you sent me too many requests. I need a second. I need a breather. Um, if you get those 429s, right, that's a pretty common status code. Anyone who's used Cosmos DB has probably seen this before. Um, so there are retries in the SDK to handle that. We know that it happens. We want to build that in, you know, a little bit of resiliency into the application. But there are limits on this, right? We don't want to retry infinitely. We don't know your application. Maybe it's never going to get, you know, cool back down. Maybe it's just running hot. Maybe there was an error, right? You're accidentally in an infinite loop or something. Um, so we don't have infinite retries. And that is important for your application to know. Really, the application developer knows best at the end of the day. So for 429s, um, 408, which is a timeout, that can happen. Again, we talked about um, those diagnostics and looking at what's going on on the client machine. It can be maybe resource contention. You have high CPU on your client machine or one machine is just faulty for some reason. Maybe you have a deployment on you know, AKS and you have a bunch of different pods and one of them is throwing errors. Um, so there, there are cases when you need to build your own retry policy, even though the SDK has the basics for you. Good stuff. Justine, are you um, doing any more speaking in the near future? Yeah. So I saw you at VS Live in Chicago. I'm uh, going to VS Live to in Redmond. Awesome. Um, yeah. So the Redmond event is going to be in August. And actually, a lot of the topics that we covered today, I'll be going over in my talk. And uh, yeah, it should be good. Justine, thank you so much. I learned a lot today. Cool. Thanks, David. It's great to chat with old friends about new technology.